One of the things that makes me a little different from many of the automotive YouTubers that we see today is the fact that I lived through the age of the muscle cars back in the early 1970s and through the 1980s. The 1970s and 1980s was a time when smog equipment mandates and the end of leaded gasoline, which basically emasculated muscle cars and all the manufacturers were scrambling all around the world, including the Japanese car makers. So during this period, Japanese sports cars were starting to find their way into the United States. Cars like the Datsun 240Z, 260Z after that, and then the 280Z, and soon cars like the Datsun 200SX and so forth. We also started to see Toyota Corollas and even a new car called the Toyota Celica, which modeled itself after a Mustang. I've owned many Datsun Z cars, as, as I've mentioned. I've owned 240s, 260s, and by the time I was in my 20s, better cars were coming from in the land of the rising sun. And I was very excited about this because where I lived, everybody's driving muscle cars, and I was the only guy driving little Japanese sports cars. And in the late 70s, we finally got the 280ZX, which gave way to the Z31 300ZX, and a little later, the Z32. Both were offered with and without a turbocharger, and I've driven both of those cars many times. So I was really excited about the Japanese cars because they were very different from the American cars. And the hits kept coming. By 1993, I was working at NGK Spark Plugs, and after spending some time training in Japan, I became very acutely aware of the evolution of the Japanese sports cars. All Up until that time, all I knew was Datsun 510s and that kind of stuff, and 240Zs, that kind of stuff. During that period, I've driven every generation of the RX-7 going back to the FA, which was a lot of back in those days. I've driven uh, two 3000 GTs. The first one was in 1995, and the next one was in uh, VR, which was about 2002, I want to say, 2003. I've also driven a few Acura NSXs, including the just-driven modified NSX, which was a work of art. If they sold that car like that back then, I probably would have bought one. I've also driven an R32, a couple of modified R33, and of course, I've owned a modified R34 and have driven a stock one as well. So I've got some, some wheel time with, with all those types of cars. I also drove every iteration of the Supra going back to the Mark 1. Well, I correct myself, I didn't drive a Mark 2. I've owned two Mark 4s, as you know, one started off as stock and then was modified, and the second was a thousand horsepower at a highly modified Supra. These cars have always been expensive, always going, going all the way back to 1979 when we saw the first ones back when they were sharing a Celica platform. But as importantly, I've driven several of the domestic competitors and even some of the foreign competitors. So how do these amazing Japanese sports cars compare to the American sports cars that were sold and running around in the United States back in the 1990s? Well, I'm gonna give you my take on this right after this break. Before we even get started, let me take a moment to say a big thank you to Surfshark VPN for sponsoring this episode. Our dependence on the internet has been rapidly increased that's no secret. The internet is how we stream our favorite shows and programming. It's how we keep in touch with our loved ones. And we even do most of our banking online these days. We'd like to think our information is safe, but with all the news about big companies having data leaks, we need to take every step possible to protect our personal data. Surfshark is a VPN service that protects your information by encrypting all the data that you send through the internet. This keeps prying eyes away and ensures that your sensitive data is always secure. If you're a global traveler like I am, you can access content that might be blocked in foreign countries. Not only is this good for people who want to keep up with their favorite shows, but it can also be a critical tool for those who live in countries that heavily censor or monitor its citizen. And right now, Surfshark has sweetened the deal with a special promo code from my YouTube viewers that offers 83% off. Just use the promo code FASTLIFE. I'll drop the link in the video descriptions down below, and the promo code will give you three free months of service. And as always, there's a 30-day no risk, money back guarantee. So if you've been paying attention, pretty much every week it seems like a classic Japanese sports car sells for a six figure sum on an auction site, bring a trailer or something like that. So I won't get into whether or not these auction cars are worth the price they are fetching. I'll just say this, they are. If someone paid $341,000 for an M Spekner R34 GT or R, it was worth that much simply because somebody paid that much. If it wasn't worth $341,000, nobody paid them for it. So it, it it's worth what somebody would pay. End of discussion. Any, any other talk beyond that is a waste of everybody's time. But this conversation is going to be different. I'm talking about were these Japanese sports cars overrated? So first we're gonna talk about what's the difference between overrated and overpriced? People get this confused all the time. Overrated basically means that people hold something in higher esteem that they ought to, meaning that they're judging it on subjective criteria. That's not very scientific. Overpriced comes down to the value. In other words, the price for what you get, right? And frankly, that, that's really the only way to objectively make such determinations. You've got to look at what you get. 
Subjective evaluations like, I like the styling of this vehicle, or it has a nice interior, pretty much don't have much of a place in this discussion. So let's take a look at the specs of the most popular Japanese sports cars of the 1990s. And I chose this period because these are the cars that are skyrocketing in price in auctions today. And people, everybody's trying to get their hands on these cars right now. So I, I took the, the best specs during the run of these cars. For example, when I looked at the FD uh, RX-7, I decided the 1995 was pretty much the peak of the FD. So so I looked at its specifications. So the original MSRP for the FD was 37,950. Car weighed only 2,800 pounds and change. Zero to 60 was 4.9 seconds, which was a rocket ship back then. Quarter mile in 13.4 seconds at 100 miles an hour. It made 255 horsepower and 217 pound-feet of torque. Ugh. There were many vans doing better today. The RX-7, of course, is a beautiful car. The lines are just perfect. The cockpit is well laid out, uh, but for a bit, it was a bit tight for me at six foot, 205 pounds, but it was lighter than any of the other contenders we're gonna talk about today, but it just didn't have any torque. For a person like me, having come from my V8 cars, like my Mustangs and all that kind of stuff, I didn't like that I had to rev the out of this thing to get it going. Passing other cars required some planning and dropping not one gear, but two. Handling was good but this car was better suited for autocross rather than open circuit because it would get smashed by these other cars making more horsepower. Let's take a look at the 97 Mitsubishi 3000 GT VR4. The original MSRP was 44,613 bucks. The car weighed 3,700 pounds, did zero to 60 in 4.8 seconds, and the quarter mile took 14.3 seconds. It did it at 100 miles an hour. It had 320 horsepower, 350 pound of feet of torque, which is pretty good. It was using a three liter V6 twin turbo. This is another classic that tempted me. A neighbor of mine had one of all these cars when I had my supercharged Mustang. That was the year before I bought my first Mark IV Supra. He let me drive his VR4. In fact, we traded cars one weekend and met up on a Sunday to do a Canyon drive. Now the VR4 felt heavy to me, but it was solid. High speed sweepers was this car's strong point. You could just connect the corners were great. It's heavyweight, made it hard to pull out of the tight quarters though. The interior was roomy compared to the others. And so it felt more like a grand touring car rather than a sports car. But I'm including in this group because it's one of the cars that people are looking at today. And it had all wheel drive, just like the R34 GTR. Next on my list is the Z32 300 ZX Twin Turbo. Original MSRP, $44,384. Weight, 3,540 pounds. Zero to 60 in five seconds, not a barn burner. Quarter mile at about 13.6 or seven uh, at 102 mile an hour. Horsepower was about 300 and the torque was about 283 pounds. This too was a three liter twin turbo V6. Shoehorned into the hood. <laughs> but of all these cars, this is the one I regret not buying. I absolutely love the look of a T-top twin turbo 300 ZX and super white. The 300 ZX is almost a foot shorter and lighter than the VR4 and you can definitely feel the difference. This car drives like a sports car but is docile enough to drive daily. It's very much like my R35. Next on the list is the 1998 Toyota Supra Twin Turbo. The spec said it weighed 3,505 pounds. Original MSRP was 49,000 bucks. The car went zero to 16 in 4.6 seconds. Uh, did the quarter mile at 13.1 at 109 miles per hour. And used a three liter inline six with twin turbos. The horsepower was 320. The torque was 350 pounds. It was a strong contender at the time, but it was pretty high price. If the car was really branded as a Grand Tour or when I think it was more of a boy racer, at least later on. When they first came out, they weren't exactly flying off showroom floors, primarily because of the high sticker. And even by 1994, just a year after it came out, the turbo prices was already over 40,000 bucks, while the Corvette ZR1 price was 34,000 bucks. The first turbo I saw on a dealer's lot was marked $45,599, and that was in 19... Six, I think. But the Super is a great platform. We all know that. But back then, nobody knew that. You know, today they can make 800 horsepower without breaking a sweat. And back then, they can make 500 horsepower very easily as well after a little experimentation. So, but you can't compare that with stock cars.
And for a moment, I want to talk about the R34 GTR. The GTR is on this list only for reference. The R34 was never sold new here in the United States, but it is a benchmark that would be valuable in this discussion. So I'm going to talk about it for a moment. The R34 weighed 3,439 pounds. The original MSRP in Japan was 46,000 bucks. If you wanted a V-Spec, it would cost you $51,000. The R34 does zero to 16, 4.9 seconds. It uses an inline six, 2.6 liter, making allegedly 276 horsepower, which is nonsense. It does a quarter mile in 13.2 seconds, according to Road Test Magazine at 111 miles an hour, which indicates that it's far more above the 276 horsepower. And while they rated the horsepower as 276, we know today that these cars really made 330 horsepower and 315 pound of torque, which exemplified in the high mile an hour on the quarter mile. So these facts make this car almost identical in performance of the Supra, roughly within $5,000 of each other. Both of the R34s I've driven prove to me that they just don't have any bad habits. They're just sure-footed in tight corners and, and in fast switchbacks. They brake like they're supposed to. They handle like they're supposed to. They respond to steering inputs like they're supposed to. And both of those cars re respond very well to modifications. So they're both fantastic cars. Next on the list is the 2002 Acura NSX. Back then they weighed 3,200 pounds. The original MSRP was over $89,000. Uh, depending on the trim. Zero to 60 went by in five seconds. The quarter mile was 13.1 seconds at 109 mile per hour. It used a 3.2 liter V6 naturally aspirated engine. Uh, made 290 horsepower and 224 pound feet of torque. That's just six more over the, the FD3 SRX7. This car was kind of twitchy if you took off the traction control, something that I discovered when working on Too Fast Too Furious. These cars also suffered from weak clutches. Uh, we went through a couple of clutches on these cars, but I got to drive two stock versions and one modified version thanks to Just Driven. Back in 2002, actually, I had a chance to buy the NSX. The car didn't really feel fast to me. More importantly, it would have been very, very expensive and complicated to add serious power to a high-strung, naturally aspirated engine. And at the time, anything less than 500 horsepower for my car was going to be unacceptable. And at that price, 90,000, you're, you're approaching Porsche territory. So now let's compare the competition from around the world. In America, what do we have back then? The Mustang, the Camaro, and the Corvette. And from Europe, the closest competitor would be the E36 M3. So let's take a look at those. Let's start with the 1998 Camaro. Got plenty of time in those cars. Weight, about 3,439 pounds. Original MSRP, $20,995. Zero to 60 was 4.9 seconds. Quarter mile was 13.6 seconds. And then 104 miles an hour using a 5.7 liter LS1 V8. The horsepower rating was 305 and the torque was 335 pounds of torque. Kind of shaky and unpredictable. A lot of cow shake. Uh, pulls like a freight train though. Fun to let the tail wag a bit. I had a lot of seat time in one of these cars. My friend Phil and I used to trade cars all the time. He'd drive my Mustang, I'd drive his Camaro Z28. Next, we'll talk about the 1998 Mustang Cobra. That car weighed 3,585 pounds. The original MSRP on that car was 25,710 bucks. Zero to 60 took 5.4 seconds. It could cover the quarter mile in 13.4 seconds at 103 miles an hour. But used a dual overhead cam, 4.6 liter V8, making 305 horsepower and 300 pound feet of torque. Smooth engine, felt kind of heavy, wallowy in the switchbacks, but in tight corners, it felt planted. Lots of nosedive on hard braking, and most important, gobs of understeer steer, which was not fun for me. I should add that the second 4.6 Mustang that I drove was supercharged and that changed everything. It was even better than Cobra if you ask me. And I need to talk about the 1994 ZR1 Corvette because the base vet was too slow to compare to the other contenders. But what was going on with the Supra, there was a big discussion between is the Supra worth it? But when you take a look at the ZR1 Corvette of that time, 1994, because there was a lot of press about that car. And why not? The car weighed only 3,500 pounds, right? But the original MSRP was 58,995 bucks. It did zero to 60 in 4.4 seconds, did the quarter mile in 12. 
4.7 seconds. Using the LT5 dual overhead cam V8, everybody was talking about it, made 405 horsepower and 385 pound-feet of torque. What Car Magazine guys were talking about, if you paid almost $50,000 or $52,000 for the top-level Supra, just for a few thousand, you can get the ZR1 Corvette. And so they were just a few thousand dollars apart at one time. And so people were crazy about that. Oh, you're gonna buy that Japanese thing? or America's best sports car. And there was a whole big discussion about that. And lastly, I want to talk about the E36 BMW M3. I skipped the C43 AMG because it's a sedan and not a coupe. And the, the CLK AMG had not yet been released. But if you look at the stats for that car, it's kind of OK. I, I looked at a 1998 BMW M3. It was pretty light, 3,100 pounds and change. But the MSRP was 45,900 bucks. Did 0 to 60 in 5.8 seconds. And that is slow for this crowd. It did the quarter mile in 14.5 seconds at only 90 miles an hour with an inline six 3.2 liter engine making 240 horsepower and 236 pound feet of torque. My only chance to drive this car came in 2004. My buddy had just sold his 87 Mustang and brought this car and took it over to my house because at the time I had an E46 M3 in my garage. I did like that it was light and it handled well but the top of the revs it seemed to run out of steam. So given what I was driving at the time it wasn't very impressive to me but going back to my Supra it would have been stomped on. So which of these cars are overrated? You have to compare what you get with each car and again and if you're just looking at the bang for the buck it's very telling you can come up with your own conclusions i think the rx7 is the best bargain among the japanese contenders today and back then you get a light and nimble chassis with good stopping distance and a quick zero to 60 time it is the least expensive of all of the 1990s japanese sports classics however their temperamental engines and the fact that they're rotaries you know you'll probably put your motor in with wing nuts because it's going to be out every two years <laughs> the acura nsx is the most overrated and most overpriced. That car was not worth $90,000 for mediocre performance back then, and it's still not worth it today, except if you're buying it because you love that car and you recognize that it was a special. So you're paying for the special thing, and this is all subjective stuff. It's like you really like green or what, something like that. But the real story is this. The American rivals like the Mustang and Camaro were reasonably similar in performance to the Japanese sports cars, and more importantly, they were half the price. You could buy pretty much two Camaros for the price of one Supra. At that time in my life, in my deep love of Japanese cars going back to the 1980s with my fixation and dots and Zs and all that kind of stuff, and by 1994, I was looking at Japanese sports cars, but at twice the price and the performance of it being only marginally better, it just didn't make sense. And it took me another four years to talk myself into buying a Supra only as a used car. Most Americans though did not. They opted for American muscle cars in 1994. You could buy a highly optioned Corvette for thousands less than the Turbo Supra, and it was reasonably comparable in performance. And at the time, the Corvette was America's top sports car. So if you go east of California, there are people sitting there, oh, no, no, man, I ain't gonna buy nothing that's bad Japanese so performance-wise, while the Japanese cars were on par or superior to their American brethren, were they worth the prices? We already know the answer, no. How do we know? Well, the RX-7 was canceled in 1996 for a number of reasons. OBD2 stuff, the value of the yen, the cooling of the economy. The Supra was no longer sold here after the 1998 model year, and it continued elsewhere in the world to 2002, but the sales numbers were very low. The Nissan 300ZX ended in 2000, partially because, again, the yen versus the dollar exchange range, which saw the ZX as MSRP skyrocket to 50,000 bucks. At $44,000, it was already a stretch, but at 50,000, it became untenable. The 3000 GT was dead by the year 2000. The NSX was done in 2005, and it didn't come back until, what, 12 years later? If these cars were a great value, they would not have died so suddenly. They were priced too high for what you were getting. The objective data, the performance, all that kind of stuff, that's the science. Everything else is subjective. But what was going on here in America at the time, most US consumers did not place too much value on quality. If you get inside any of the Japanese sports cars versus any of the American sports cars at that time, the Japanese cars seemed to be miles ahead of the American cars in build quality and just fit and finish and feel. But horsepower and torque, and a cheaper price swayed their choices. They was all about, if I'm buying a sports car, I wanna get as much sports out of this car as I can. So again, overrated means that people hold something in higher esteem than they ought to, 
And by this definition, they're judging by subjective criteria and not performance. And if they're judging by performance, they're going to pick the American cars nine times out of ten. And now, today, everybody realizes how great these cars are, and that's why the prices are going up today. Are they worth it? They're worth whatever they hammer balls for. If you're seeing Supers at $300,000, that's because somebody's pay willing to pay $300,000. These cars were fantastic. Uh, you may say they were overrated, overfluffed, whatever. This made motorsports journalists should probably share in that blame. But the simple fact of the matter is that they were not what they were propped up to be. They were not a great value. That's it for this time, everybody. Thanks for watching.